all done. Um, so uh, next we've got um, Rowan, um, one of two Rowans. So this is Rowan Mason. Um, and Rowan's been investigating physiological traits associated with wheat canopy architecture. Um, so take it away, Rowan. Just doing the screen sort of there. Yeah, it's working. Okay, so hello everyone. My name's Rowan Mason. Here you can see two different varieties of wheat. On the left, leaves are visibly much more erect than the, than the right. Some recent findings have shown that wheat can yield significantly more when the canopy is erect rather than fluffy. Since canopy architecture is variable among wheat cultivars, I was interested in probing these differences and their implications for crop performance. Reading the literature, the general consensus is that the global food production needs to double by 2050. And we need to do this without increasing crop area or greatly increasing inputs. Wheat provides almost 20% of all calories consumed by people. And annual yield increases need to um, increase by 1.7% in order to ensure food security. Development of superior varieties for specific environments is important for maintaining yield increases. Breeding for tolerance to environmental stress can increase yield by mitigating loss, while breeding for yield potential raises the ceiling for production. The yield potential is a function of the total biomass and the harvest index under ideal conditions. Harvest index, which describes the partitioning of carbon towards grain, has improved a lot since the discovery of a small number of genes which reduce plant stature. However, increases in plant biomass have been harder to come by because production of that biomass is under complex polygenic control. When all other factors are accounted for, crop biomass is driven by the amount of solar radiation arriving at the crop and the efficiency with which the crop can convert incoming radiation to chemical energy, energy and assimilate carbon. This is called radiation use efficiency and it's measured in terms of grams of crop biomass per megajoule of solar radiation. Now radiation use efficiency is driven by the rate of photosynthesis at the leaf level and the effectiveness of the canopy at intersecting light. Now in C3 plants like wheat, photosynthesis plateaus at light intensities well below full sunlight. So where leaves are more floppy, theory suggests you end up with an upper canopy inter intercepting light intensities well beyond the levels needed for photosynthesis and excessive shading in the lower canopy. With more erect leaves, same amount of light can penetrate deeper into the canopy and it's spread across, across a larger leaf area. In this scenario, leaves are much more likely to be working in this range and less of the light resource is wasted. There's evidence to suggest that an erect canopy type is actually the norm for important cereals such as rice and maize. However, it is variable in wheat. As we can see here with these three examples of Australian wheat cultivars all grown in the same environment. Top and bottom photos are from around flag leaf emergence and flowering respectively. One of my co-supervisors, Richard Richards, developed a one to 10 scoring system for phenotype canopy architecture where one is the most erect and 10 is the most floppy. I'll first talk about my field site before introducing my um, research questions, just because the crop was already in the ground before I became involved and I needed to design my experiment around what was already in place. The crop was located at CSIRO's Jim and Dara site, just north of Canberra, and it was sown on the 30th of April, 2019 for Dr. Richard Richards. The main purpose of this planting was to increase seed for future experiments in wheat canopy architecture. There are 146 inbred lines derived from the cross between revenue and sun state, which are thought to be contrasting for canopy architecture. A randomized complete block design was used with two reps of each line, including the parent varieties. 
and seven commercial cultivars will also sign as check plots at one end of the paddock to act as benchmark. I was on site during two periods, late September, which occurred around flag leaf emergence, and late October, which was close to an anthesis on the flowering. Now, the, the timing of my visits was important, and they were planned to coincide with the beginning and the end of the critical period for the determination of grain number, which is very closely associated with grain yield. Also being used over the experiment was this phenotyping platform called the Phenomobile. It captures 3D point cloud data using a LiDAR sensor to estimate crop traits, which are normally really time consuming to measure. For each plot, average values for crop height above ground biomass and fractional cover are recorded simultaneously in a matter of seconds at walking pace. It also records NDVI with a green seeker to give an indication of basic plant health and an easy value for comparison between plots. I did briefly get to drive it, but not over the crop, just back to the, back to the trailer that it lives in. Now, I had two main research questions that I was interested in answering, and I'll go through them individually, presenting my methods and results and discussion as I go. For my first question, I wanted to check the comparability between the manual crop measurements and the estimates from the Phenomobile before I committed to doing further analyses based on the Phenomobile outputs. I decided to compare just the biomass and the crop height estimates as fractional cover would have been too time consuming to do manually during my short visit. Biomass cuts at Anthesis were already planned for other parts of the experiment in all 315 plots. So I just needed to get average heights from each plot for each of my visits. As you can see, the relationship between the manual and the proximally sensed methods are not so strong, at least using the data for, from, my, from these rounds of sampling. Uh, the, the relationship was slightly stronger between the crop height data than for biomass, but it was still overestimating the phenomobile was overestimating crop ties, especially as the crop got taller. And there was also almost no relationship between the two biomass like estimates. This could be due to a number of reasons, I thought. My quadrats, which were at only 0 0.4 square meters, may have been too small to give an accurate estimate of biomass for the entire plot, while the phenomobile um, use data from the whole plot to calculate the average. Or the phenomobile may still have some systemic biases which I can't account for. If confidence in using this platform is improved, there could be, I think there could be potential to develop a quantitative measure for measuring canopy architecture using the phenomobile LiDAR data. I think this could be possible because the point cloud data that it produces gives a high resolution estimate of the leaf area distribution in the vertical dimension. For my second research question, I wanted to know whether the theory held up. Does an erect canopy type increase radiation eutrophicity, total biomass accumulation and grain yield? To do this, canopy score, which I described earlier, was established in all plots. It was done on multiple days to get an average score around each sampling time. Above ground dry, mat dry matter from quadrat cuts was taken at both sampling days. And I sampled about a third of all plots during my first visit, when all plot and then all plots were sampled during anthesis plus seven days, which was spread over a window of 20 days. Radiation use deficiency for the period between sampling dates could then be calculated using the change in above ground dry matter and the cumulative solar radiation exposure for each plot adjusted for flowering date. A grain yield was taken using all rows of the plot excluding out, outside rows to reduce edge effects. Here the white circles indicate the 91 plots for which I completed biomass sampling during my first visit. And then biomass cuts, as I said, were, were taken for all plots at Anthesis 
across seven days. Some, some plots by me, but other plots, most of the plots by CSIRO staff. Again, the results suggest that canopy architecture had little to no effect on anthesis plus seven day biomass, nor radiation use efficiency for the period assessed. The leaf area, which was also investigated on a subset of plots, but in the interest of time, I'll just note that it bore no significant relationship with canopy score either. The wide variation in flowering date may be a source of error, which was not accounted for for the results in biomass, as anthesis was spread over a window of 20 days. Unexplained variation in radiation use efficiency may be present, as only global radiation was used for its calculation, rather than photosynthetically active radiation, or PAR. You can also see that the spread of the data the data spreads further as canopy score increases or becomes more floppy. Spread also increases from left to right in the results for grain yield, which appeared to have little to no relationship with canopy architecture in this instance. The lack of a trend in all three of these results is less surprising when you look at the distribution of canopy scores for this whole population. The curve centers around scores of two or three and represents a notable restriction on my data set. The high frequency of the reactor file phenotypes may simply reflect the high gene frequency for that form of the trait. I think this, that this is possible considering the population is being bred up to investigate the advantages of, of, of canopy erectness. It's also possible that seasonal and site related factors had an impact. This is likely since canopy architecture is a complex polygenic trait, and polygenic traits are inherently affected by genotype by environment interactions. Repeating the experiment over different sites and years could make this a lot clearer. At a different site in 2010, Richards found a much more significant association between canopy architecture and grain yield. The most erectile file lines had a 25% yield advantage over the most planophile lines. However, their study used a total of 1,000 unique lines, and canopy architecture was normally distributed between the two extremes. If the present study had a greater diversity in canopy types and more lines, the effects on biomass, radiation use efficiency, and grain yield may have been more pronounced. Looking back at what I found, the fact that proximally sensed measurements from the phenomil field didn't marry up with the destructive sampling limited my ability to do more work with its outputs. If confidence was improved, I think there is potential to develop a method for quantitative assessment of canopy architecture using the leaf area distribution. But as with all indirect measurements, a lot of work would be required in terms of ground truthing and calibration. But this is the reality for it for any high throughput phenotyping technique. And accurate phenotyping is a, a, a growing area of research. I also found that my data set was too restricted to draw any clear conclusions about the effect of canopy architecture on radiation use efficiency, biomass production, and grain yield. I would improve this by designing the next experiment from scratch, making sure the population was more diverse in terms of canopy architectures, and less varied in terms of flowering date. And if possible, I would do it over successive years and over different locations to account for genotype by environment interaction. I'd really like to think, thank my supervisors and co-supervisors, Tina Acuna, Richard Richards, and Angela Mary, and also Rebecca Lovell and Graham Gimili for their help in the field in Canada. That was really helpful. And I had a fantastic time doing the experiment. I thought it was a, a great opportunity to see a, a breeding population of wheat, which is, I think, is a fascinating crop. Thanks for listening. Uh, well, great. Um, thanks, Rowan. Does anyone have any questions so far for Rowan? I've got one. Oh, perfect. Thanks. Go ahead. Um. I just, I want to know why you think, or why why people think, I guess, um, 
most, why multiple gene traits are much more affected by the environment than single gene traits? I think the, added, the additive nature of them means that if there is something going on, well, it, it, it's less, um, less of a sort of binary effect. It's not a sort of on or off switching of the genes. It's more, it's, it's harder to account for, I suppose. Thanks. Um, and Rowan, you mentioned that if you could do this again, like you'd almost start from scratch, you would look mm -hmm. at controlling um, flowering time, uh, different canopy. What, which one factor do you think would be the, the best one for you to, to control or to change again if you could do this experiment again in the future? Well, I think ensuring that we had the, um, a wide enough variation in the independent variable, which is the canopy, which was canopy architecture in this instance, I think is quite important. Otherwise, you just don't have that the uh, the breadth of data that you really need to draw any conclusions. You just as when you get to the tails of the population, this the spread of the data just blows out, and it's hard to draw any real conclusions. Uh, yep, no, really good point. Um, Question here from Ruben. Um, could you please comment on the potential benefits of changing radiation inception by plant spacing, etc., instead of breeding? Um, yeah, I suppose that is the point. But I think you would probably you might end up with sort of less ears per unit area of a crop. Um, you also depending on the environment, your, your evapotranspiration would increase with um, exposed soil. And um, yeah, uh, competition with weeds would be less strong as well. So you may have to do a bit more in terms of weed control. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of trade-offs in terms of plant spacing and plant density. So there, there are a couple of them. That I think. Sorry, I can't hear you, Matt. That's right. Uh, another question from um, Adele this time. Uh, does latitude have any effect that you know of? I think, yeah, it definitely would, which I, um, if you think about the theory in my, in my earlier slides, they were sort of thinking about top-down radiation at nadir, sort of 90 degrees and the effect of shading. But also I think in a, uh, if, you, if your location has a higher sort of degree of diffuse radiation, that would make a lot more difference than if you have a lot more sunny days because your effect of shading would be decreased if you have a lot more cloudy, cloudy days during the growing season. Whereas if it was sunny, a lot more sunny days during the growing season, the effect of shading would probably be higher. Yep, a really good answer. Okay. Um, any more questions for, for Rob? If not, really good job and um, yeah.